What does the word Hosanna mean? Hosanna means save us. And so on Palm Sunday, we recognize that there's only one who can save us. And so we turn our attention toward our Savior, Jesus, and we say, Hosanna. You are the one who can, and so we look to you for salvation. So that's what they were saying back then on Palm Sunday, 2,000 plus years ago. And so that's what we say today again. We recognize you, Jesus, as our Savior. So happy Palm Sunday from DBICC live stream. Thank you for joining us. Uh, several things I want to make you aware of. First of all, we have our prayer time each night from 9 to 10 p.m. And so you can go to our website to find the link to, to the Google Meet. Uh, but we'd love to see you if you want to join us to pray. We're praying about uh, the COVID-19 situation. We're also just praying for other things as God brings them up and as we have these things that we're aware of. And so, yeah, I want to welcome you. There's no pressure if you want to come and join for three minutes or five minutes or the whole time. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but, yeah, I just want to make you aware that we're doing that. I hope that you're finding a way to pray, whether it's one minute at 1 o'clock or on the 19s of each hour or whatever, that you're finding some way to just to go to God in this time and to have a conversation with him. While there's so many things that are uncertain, we want to make sure we're leaning on the rock and going to him with all of these things that are on our hearts. Um, also want to remind you about our virtual terrace time. And so it's nice for me to be able to have a chance to see other people and to interact. And uh, it's fun to talk. And so uh, I invite you on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 4 to 5 p.m., uh, there's a Google Meet link. You can just go, and then we can hang out a little bit. Uh, we've had some interesting conversations uh, this last week, but uh, again, want to make you aware of that. If you need some interaction time, some of you are extroverts, and so you need more talking time, more, more words uh, that you can have a chance to say to people, so um, come and hang out, Terrace Time, 4 to 5. Uh, this next week is Easter, and so we're going to have a special Easter uh, celebration There'll be some unique things, some special things for the children. It's all going to be online, obviously. We're not going to be able to meet together. Uh, but be looking for the information about how we're going to provide some unique opportunities to celebrate Easter this next week. Also want to remind you that uh, for Right Now Media, we've consolidated down and said, hey, here's 10 studies for adults that we think will be great. And then also 10 for children, 10 programs for the kids and so uh, I know this next week some of you are starting your Easter break, and so you'll have some more time. The kids won't be on the computer as much. Man, what a great time to be able to take advantage of Right Now Media and all the, the amazing stuff that's there for kids and for adults. So I want to encourage you uh, to take advantage of Right Now Media and spend some time learning. A again, amazing resources available for you there. Uh, today I want to make sure that you can uh, welcome um, I, I want to welcome you, rather, to our office here. You can say hi to our team. And so at the computer, we have Katie. At the Pro Presenter computer, we have Jeremy. And then Martin is directing. You guys can wave. There they are. There's the team making things happen here in the office. And so, yeah, super thankful for these guys who are willing to come in early and do our rehearsal earlier in the week and then come early this morning to make sure everything's working uh, to the best of our knowledge. And so, it's not easy to pull all these things off, make sure everything's plugged in, the delays and everything are set correctly. And so uh, thankful for these guys and the hard work that they've put in uh, to make all of this, all of this happen. Um, so this morning I have a special prayer experience for us. This is, again, from 247prayer.com. It's a website uh, where they actually have prayer around the clock. And so here's a special prayer that I want us to go through. And there's a chance for you to respond. And so as you go through the, the prayer, there'll be a part that I read. And then whenever it says response, that's for you to, to just read together out loud. And so uh, we'll walk through this prayer together. Whenever we get to the section that says um, Jehovah, I'm going to replace that with Yahweh. So whenever you see that, don't be surprised. Uh, but yeah, let's go through this prayer together. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to protect us from the spread of this coronavirus. You are powerful and merciful. Let this be our prayer. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Yahweh Shalom, Lord of peace. We remember those living in coronavirus hotspots and those currently in isolation. May they know your presence in their isolation, your peace 
in their turmoil and your patience in their waiting. Prince of peace, you are powerful and merciful. Let this be their prayer. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, God our Savior, for the glory of your name. God of all comfort and counsel, we pray for those who are grieving, reeling from the sudden loss of loved ones. May they find your fellowship in their suffering, your comfort in their loss, and your hope in their despair. We name before you those known to us who are vulnerable and scared, the frail, the sick, and the elderly. You can name some names now. God of all comfort, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Yahweh Rapha, God who heals. We pray for all medical professionals dealing daily with the intense pressures of this crisis. Grant them resilience in weariness, discernment in diagnosis, and compassion upon compassion as they care. We thank you for the army of researchers working steadily and quietly towards a cure. Give them clarity, serendipity, and unexpected breakthrough today. Would you rise above this present darkness as the sun of righteousness with healing in your rays? May this be our prayer. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God of all wisdom, we pray for our leaders, the World Health Organization, national governments, and local leaders too, heads of schools, hospitals, and other institutions. Since you have positioned these people in public service for this hour, we ask you to grant them wisdom beyond their own wisdom to contain this virus. Faith beyond their own faith to fight this fear and strength beyond their own strength to sustain vital institutions through this time of turmoil. God of all wisdom and counsel, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I bless you with the words of Psalm 91. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. May El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, who loves you, protect you. May Jesus Christ, his son, who died for you, save you. And may the Holy Spirit, who broods over the chaos and fills you with his presence, intercede for you and in you for others at this time. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, Father, we just say this morning that our hope is in you. Our hope is in you. And we thank you that as we look through history, as we look through scriptures, we can see that's a safe place for our hope. Other things may fail, other things may come and go, but Lord, we know that you are secure. And so Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters out there, for children, for people who are in difficult situations. Lord, we ask for your peace. We ask for your presence. 
Lord, we ask for your love to be felt. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we can escape your love. Even if we tried, we cannot escape. And so may that be obvious to us in these days. May we sense your presence closer than ever. Lord, the enemy wants to discourage us and to to pull us away, but Lord, we want to run to you and rest in you. And I pray that we can do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thanks for being with us. We're on our fifth and final week of the Diaspora series. And so when we began this series, uh, you know, five weeks ago, we were saying, hey, look, we're scattered all over the world. People were all over the place. And, and so we're saying, look, if, if we're going to be these different places in these different areas of the world, let's be light and let's be salt. And so the, the idea was if we could just have five topics that uh, I could preach to the whole world, what would those five be? And so we've b- going through these basic topics about some simple things that actually can make a huge difference in the way we live our lives and walk in our relationship with God. And so I hope it's been good for you as you've been thinking about some of these basic things, maybe going back to some foundational truths and hopefully having some conversations with people that are around you. Many are back. Some are still away, but many are back in Discovery Bay now. And so welcome back. Uh, Some are still wearing bracelets and and separated uh, from being able to get out and around. Uh, but lots of people are still out, uh, st- still uh, here, and, and even though we're here sometimes, we, we don't get to go out and, and mingle as much as we would like, and so we're still scattered, even though we may be back in the same geographical location. And so in your homes, in your uh, smaller circles of relationships, I hope that these, these messages, these truths can spur some conversations that will be helpful for you. And so just to review quickly, uh, the first week we said, hey, There's this big lie that Satan's been telling from the very beginning, and that is that God is against you. But there's a truth that God loves us. And so whenever we can remember that, it's a big deal for us. Week two, we talked about the final score. We looked at the end of the book, and we see that God wins. And so we want to be on his team because his team is the winning team. Week three, we looked at acid test and said, look, everything that we're doing one day is going to be tested by fire. And so we want to be sure that what we're spending our life on, our time, our resources, our talents. We need to make sure we're spending those, investing those in things that count. And then last week, we looked at our super weapon. As Christians, we have this amazing opportunity to impact the spiritual realm, which is the foundation of the physical realm. And so we have a direct line of access to God through prayer. And so we should make the most of this super weapon that is prayer. And hopefully, uh, you've, in- encouraged, uh, you've been encouraged to pray more this week. And so today we're going to talk about the next, the next subject, and that is the X factor. The X factor. And so today we're looking at this, this topic. It's out of John chapter 13. So if you want to get your Bible and turn over to John 13, we'll go there in just a minute. But the X factor. Maybe you've heard of the it factor, um, but there's a, c- a couple of different uh, phrases people use to describe this, this idea that there's an intangible something about a person or a situation that people can feel. I heard a story uh, about an actor named Keanu Reeves. Maybe you remember this guy, Canadian actor. Early in his career, he was auditioning for a part, and so he goes before the the crew that's looking at him, you know, the different um, candidates for the job, and so he comes in, and he, he auditions, and they said, oh my goodness, that guy's terrible. He didn't do well at all, and so he went away, but as they were going through, they couldn't find anyone else to fill that role, and so uh, the, the, the director said, okay, let's go back and let's look at who else we've uh, already had come in. And he showed a picture of Keanu Reeves. He said, okay, remember this guy? And they said, oh, yeah, we remember him. He didn't do well at all. He said, well, maybe we can give him another try. So they called him back again, and he came in, and he did terrible again. And so they said, oh, goodness, that guy's not good. But they still weren't able to fill the role, even with the other people they evaluated. And so the director pulled his picture out again and said, remember this guy? And they said, oh, yeah, we remember him. And so they said, he did terrible, but he said, why don't we bring him in again? He said, okay, we'll bring him in again. So this happened four times where he came in to audition, according to the story, and he did terrible, but at the end, the director said, look, you said he did terrible, but you kept allowing me to bring him back. And so there was something about him that even though there were some parts that weren't great, there was other things that just were captivating about him. And so he ended up getting the role even though he didn't do well in his audition. He had the X factor. He had the it factor. There was something about him, something intangible. And so it's not about a skill necessarily or a pedigree. 
you, and you can't really put your finger on it sometimes when you think about, okay, what is it about people? And so whenever, whenever we think about ourselves as Christians, as followers of Christ, what would be that it factor, that X factor, that whenever we walk in the room, people just have this sense of, you know what, I don't necessarily like the way they look, the way they dress, the way they talk, but there's something about them that's magnetic, that draws me in. And I, I don't know what it is, but there's something. Well, what is that for us? It's hard to quantify, but as we're going to look at this, I want to read a passage out of 1 Corinthians 13 to get us in the mindset of what this X factor is for Christians. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So you can tell what the X factor is when we read this passage. Love. Love has to be our motivation. Even if we have these gifts, even if we have these skills and all these projects and tasks that we do for God, even if we sacrifice ourselves, but if we don't have love as the motivation underneath all of it, We're wasting our time and energy. Love has to be the X factor in our lives. And so I was telling my wife that I was preaching about love today. She said, well, you need to wear a red shirt because it's about love. You need to wear a red shirt. And uh, I said, well, it's not really that kind of love, you know. And and it is, um, but we're talking about something more, right? So think about uh, Valentine's Day type love, okay? Um, I'm very blessed. Both of my grandparents on my father's and mother's side, both sets of grandparents, celebrated 70 plus years of marriage, okay? A 70 year anniversary, okay? So I got to see that. Now I want you to compare the kind of love that you see between teenagers on Valentine's Day and the kind of love you see after 70 years of marriage. How do those compare? Well, they don't, right? The first kind is just a hint of what love really is. And the other one's like the real thing, the kind of love that puts up with things that, man, oh, wow, that was really tough, but I still love you anyway. It's sacrificial. It is giving. It is willing to be patient. So all kinds of things are different about a mature love. What we're talking about here really is agape love. And so, again, we come back to this idea. It's not a surprise that what we should have as Christians, our defining feature, should be love. Why? Because remember what we talked about the very first week? God is love. God is love. And so if he is love, if this is his main attribute that Satan wants to attack and wants to knock down, then, of course, that should be our main feature as well, that we are people of love. That's a defining feature for him, John 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love, and so we should be the same way. And so we look at John chapter 13, verse 35, and we can see where Jesus is talking about a new commandment to his disciples. He's telling them, look, I'm giving you something new. It's not about all these commandments, but about love. It's about how you love each other. And so in verse 35, John 13, verse 35, he says this, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So this is how they will know. This is how other people will know that you're my disciples. You have love for one another. So this is our trademark. It's our mark of authenticity. 
And as Christians, as followers of Jesus, it's our birthright to be the ones who carry love. You know, other groups that are out there in society say, you know, we're the people who love. It's like, no, Christians ought to be known as the people of love. You know, whenever you go out into town, especially in Hong Kong, some people are really caught up in having the right uh, type of watch or the right brand of shoes or the right brand of suit or, or whatever. You know, the purse has to be the right brand, have the right logo on it. Otherwise, you're not in the cool crowd, right? Well, for us as Christians, the logo that should be on us is love. It should be obvious that we are people of love. Now, when we talk about being people of love, that doesn't mean we're 100% tolerant, you know, it's licensed for people to do anything. You know what? It doesn't matter what you do. I just love you. Everything's okay. That's not what we're talking about. And we know that love has two sides. There is the forgiving, patient side, but there's also the truth-telling protecting side where there's this reproof and discipline, not just, you know, hey, you do whatever you want to do because I love you. Um, in fact, how does God love us? Proverbs 3.12 says he disciplines those that he loves. He doesn't just let us go and do whatever we want all the time. Otherwise, we're going to hurt ourselves. You think about, uh, you know, adults who are out playing in the middle of the street. And whenever you see those adults in the street, you say, those guys are pretty foolish. They don't have a clue what they're doing. What's wrong with those guys, right? But if you see children playing out in the street, what's your first thought? Where are the parents? You know, loving parents don't let their kids play in the middle of the street because they love them. They're going to make sure they take care of them and don't just let them run off like that, right? And so love includes some boundaries and some discipline and some reproof and some truth-telling. Hey, look. You can't go out there. You're going to hurt yourself if you do that. So that's what love is. Love includes some discipline and some truth-telling. You know, I remember uh, Jesus whenever he was talking to Peter. So Peter said, uh, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then um, a minute later, he says, oh, you're not going to go to be, be crucified. Don't worry about it. And so uh, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So Jesus loves Peter very well, but he calls him Satan. Why? Well, because in that moment, he was representing a lie and not the truth. And so he, in love, disciplined him and reproved him. Hey, that's not right. You're not going the right direction. Just this morning, I was reading about Mark, uh, in Mark chapter 10, where Jesus is talking to uh, the rich young ruler. And he talks about, you know, how do I make it to heaven? And, and Jesus says, you know what, you're just missing one thing. And before he gives him the instructions, it says, Jesus looked on him with love. And he said, you lack one thing, sell everything you have, give it away, and come follow me. And so in love, Jesus points out the one area in this guy's life that's not right. And it was a loving act. And so this is the kind of love we're talking about. Now, we have to be careful that we don't go too far on this side of discipline and reproof, because sometimes, and that's all we are for other people, right? And we become legalistic, uh, we become judgmental, and we begin to tear each other down. And so we need to make sure that we have the patience and the grace, and the willingness to put up with stuff from people. But we also, at the right time, as the Spirit leads us, speak truth. And we come in and say, no, hey, this isn't the right way. I love you too much to allow you to continue down the path. But what we're talking about here is having genuine love, genuine love. And it's not for our enemies. Okay, now Jesus did say in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you should love your enemies. He says, anybody can love their friends. That's normal. But for you, you need to love your enemies. And so that's a different topic for another day. But in today's message, in John chapter 13, verse 35, he says, this is how you'll know, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He's talking about in your own circle, in your own group, you need to love each other. You need to care for one another. This is what will set you apart. This is how we will be different if we truly love each other. Now, whenever we look at this idea of loving one another, we, we have to just be honest and say, you know what? There's some people that are not easy to love. In fact, sometimes loving people around us feels kind of like trying to love one of these animals right here, right? Nobody wants to cuddle up with a porcupine. It hurts. And sometimes loving other people that are around us, even within our own community, feels like that. We try to love them and, ooh, we get hurt. We get stung. And so we want to pull back and we want to stay away. And so loving people in difficult situations is not easy, but that's what Jesus is saying we need to do. We don't just kick people out. We love them. We try to 
find a way to love them. Jim Wilder has written a book called Joy Starts Here, and he talks about the key for transformation. He says this. He says, transformation can only happen when you have two things, the strong and the weak together. You see, if you only have the weak together, they can't help each other because they're all weak. If you only have the strong together, then the strong don't have anybody to help because they're all strong, and so they get stagnant and stale. He says, but when you have the strong and the weak together, now the strong can use their skills, use their strength to help someone in need, and then the person who's weak has a person to help them out. And so transformation can only happen, can only happen when you have the strong and the weak together. And so we as a church, DBICC, we have to get in this mode of not just us, not just us perfect people are allowed, not just those of us who have it all figured out, but anybody. And sometimes the weak people are what we need most. Or sometimes we are the weak people and we need someone strong to help us. You know, we looked at um, 1 Corinthians 13 where we talk about uh, love and how it's important. Well, just before that, in chapter 12, he's talking about the body and how some parts are not the favorite ones. And we don't want to be around those parts of the body. But he, he addresses this directly. In verse 21 of chapter 12, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the hand, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for, here's these two words again, one another. That the members may care for one another, the strong ones and the weak ones, mixed up, caring for one another. And again, this doesn't feel good, right? This isn't eros love or phileo love where, you know, you help me, I help you. This is agape love. And I want to remind you, this kind of love is a choice. Love at this level is something we decide, we choose to do. This is the kind of love that gets you to 70 years of marriage. You know what? You don't deserve it. You deserve for me to totally run out and say, hey, this is over, but I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to forgive you anyway. I'm going to put up with your craziness. I'm going to put up with your mood or whatever it is anyway. I'm choosing to love you. And that's the kind of love we're talking about that we need to have for each other. This is the X factor that sets us apart. You see, Jesus captured it really well in John 15, 13, whenever he says this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Well, of course, this doesn't feel good to sacrifice yourself. But Jesus is saying, this is the type of love I'm talking about. And he showed that with his own life. All right, so there you go. Everybody feel good about that? We're done with the Diaspora series. Go love each other in a sacrificial way. Lay down your lives for each other. It'll be fun. Have a good day, right? No, no, no. You're like, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're really going to put that on us? You're going to tell us we have to love people at that level? That's too much. And I just want to back up and say, you know what? You're right. It is too much. This is not natural to lay down your life for other people especially those you don't like, that's totally not natural. In fact, I would say it's impossible for us to do it. Really, the way God wants us to, it's impossible for us to do. But let's just rewind the tape a little bit and look at this whole series and look at what we have said, okay? So over the last few weeks, here's what we've said. We said, first of all, remember. Remember that God loves me and don't believe the lie, all right? So that's the first thing. Second thing we have to maintain a proper perspective that we win, okay? So remember, maintain. And then the third week, we said we need to make sure we invest our lives in the right thing, okay? And don't invest in the wrong thing. Invest in the right place. So remember, maintain, invest. And then last week, we said we need to pray, okay? So now we need to pray. We need to make sure that we're spending the time connecting to God that we should. So remember, maintain, invest, 
pray. Okay, got all those things. And then now today we're saying we need to love with a sacrificial love. Okay, so remember, maintain, invest, pray, love. There you go. There's your list of things to do. And you would say, okay, that's too much. I can't even get along with my wife while we're here stuck in the house. I can't even get homeschool stuff accomplished with my kids. We're way behind on getting everything uploaded to the web. No, I, I get it. And that's the whole point. We can't do this in our own strength. Okay, but maybe if we just simplify it down, we can get this going on our own, right? So let's just simplify this thing down. What if we just had two things to do? What if these were the only two things? Number one, love God and then love people. Jesus said all the laws can be summed up in these two things, love God and love people. So if we could just do that, now we can really wrap our arms around that and make that happen, right? We can do that, right? We think we can. The reality is we can't do that. That's too much for us. And so here's what I want us to do today as we wrap up this series. And we've looked at all these important things that we need to be carrying day to day in our minds, in our hearts, in our actions, in our words, in our attitudes, in our relationship with God, our relationship with others. Here's what we really come all the way down to, and that is this, to be loved. To allow God to love us. To open ourselves up to what he has for us. That's where we have to start. It's not about our performance. You see, whenever I'm laying out these five things, some of you, because you're task-oriented, you're get-or-done type A, go-for-it type people, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to add this to my list, and this week I'm going to make it happen. And the reality is you can't. You're going to end up burning out. You're going to end up being frustrated and legalistic and not fun to be around. And so, no, don't do that. What all of us need to do is come back to this point where we say, you know what, God, we can't do this without you. So we're going to set aside our desire to perform well and just open up our hearts and say, we're going to receive what you have for us. We're going to receive the love that you want to pour into our hearts. And we know that that will transform us. You're the strong one. We're the weak one. And as we allow you to help us, transformation can happen. In Galatians chapter 5, we read about the fruit of the Spirit. And there are nine fruits listed. You know what the first one is? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. So if we're going to love well, the source of that love is going to be God himself, the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We can't make it happen on our own. But that's great. We have a source. We have the supply available to us. God wants to supply that love. He wants to pour that into us by his spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, and he tells his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. People will know. You'll be witnesses for me. And so we receive the power when the Holy Spirit is the one working in us. And so this is not about how hard we can work, how many boxes we can check, how many tasks we can tick off and saying, we, we did those. It's about just rec you know, receiving from God, surrendering to his way. And so you know what, God? I can't do it. So I'm going to turn my attention to you and allow you to work through my life. And then that will make the difference. And so for Christians today, I just want to pray over you that, that God would pour into you the love, that you would allow him. Now, whenever he comes in, he may point out some things that are interfering, some other gods that you're worshiping that have to be removed so you can worship him well and receive love from him fully. And so I just want to pray for you at this time and ask God to help you and me in this journey. And so, Father, we come to you, and we've talked about some great stuff. We've looked at some amazing passages of Scripture but it all really comes down to a simple thing, and that is we can't do it on our own, but we don't have to. You've supplied the power by your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I just ask that you would open our eyes. Holy Spirit, help us to see, to sense the areas where we are not surrendered and give them up to turn our hearts toward you. And instead of trying to work hard to do this and do that, that rather we would just say yes and surrender and give up 
and allow you to guide us, our thinking, our words, our attitudes, our actions, that they would be fueled by your power, your love. And so as we receive your love in our lives, we would have something to share with other people around us. Lord, we want to look different. We want to be your children. We want to be your witnesses for people to know. And so we, we say we depend upon you for this. And God, I thank you for what's going to happen as my brothers and sisters just come to you, not to try to earn your approval, but rather to walk in your favor and to walk in your power. And so I ask for, for changes, for transformation to happen as we allow your strength to transform our weakness. And we ask for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we've said, Jesus is the perfect example. And so whenever we talk about love, the greatest act of love is the one lays down his life for his friends. And if one can love enemies, that's even better. But that's what Jesus did for us. In fact, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so God shows his love for us in this. While we were sinners, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. And so again, some of you, you, today, you don't even have a relationship with God. The Holy Spirit can't pour power into you to have love and to walk through life the way you should because you don't have that, that connection yet. So today I want to encourage you, if you don't know God, if you haven't begun a relationship through Jesus, why are you waiting? You can't do enough good things, and you know that. That weight of guilt and shame that you're carrying, you can't take care of it. Only Jesus can. So why don't you trust him today? Why don't you trust Jesus today? What a cool day, Palm Sunday of 2020. What a great day to begin your relationship. And this week, as you look at the passion of Jesus, as he goes through all these different steps leading to the cross and then um, the burial and the resurrection next, next Sunday. And what a great week. By the way, I want to encourage you to be reading this week, to look at uh, Luke chapter 19 on Monday. Start reading in chapter 19. And on Tuesday, chapter 20, on Wednesday, 21, all the way through Friday, chapter 23. Don't read anything on Saturday. And just remember, Christ is buried. He's in the grave for me. And then Sunday, read chapter 24 of Luke. So that can be a great um, study for you this week as we uh, lead up to Easter. But for those of you who haven't trusted Christ, today is the day. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Because even tomorrow, you'll have to say, you know what, is it going to be today or tomorrow? And the enemy wants you to keep delaying and postponing. But today is the day. Will you trust Christ today? Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. And so there's this faith side and this outward confession part as well. And so you can do that, just like that. You can make a decision in your heart and tell someone and be saved. Uh, for other people, it's meaningful and helpful to have a prayer. And so if you're ready to trust Christ today and you want to pray a prayer, here's a prayer. There's nothing magic about this prayer, but this may be a reflection of your heart. And so if you want to trust Christ today and you're interested in praying a prayer like this, you can just repeat this after me. And so would everyone bow your head and close your eyes. And maybe today, if you're ready to trust Christ, you can just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. Today I turn from my own way and I choose to trust you and follow you. Please forgive my sins and make me a new person. I give myself to you. Thank you. Amen. If you've trusted Christ today, congratulations. This is the reason he came, for you, so that you could have a relationship with God, that you could be forgiven, you could have the promise of life forever. As we head toward Easter next week, there's going to be just an amazing excitement, I believe, in your heart as we celebrate the life that you now can enjoy because of what Jesus has done, the decision you've made today to become a Christian. If you've done that, we would love to know about that. And so you can just uh, tell someone or you can email us. We have an email set up, yes at dbicc.org. And you can just send the email saying, I said yes to Jesus. And we would be happy to celebrate with you and give you some resources to, as you begin this journey. Well, thank you for joining us today. And so whether you're uh, seeking, okay, how do I love at the level God wants? 
whether you're beginning a relationship with God or whether you're asking questions. Okay, I don't know. Man, we want to journey with you. So please take advantage of our prayer request option on our webpage or, or contact one of us and let us walk with you through whatever is going on in your life. Uh, I love you. Thank you for joining us today and God bless you.